Hi, I'm Trish Lynch. I'm here for Politipeeps. We are talking today about uh, heavy metal music and its relation to libertarianism. We're going to cover the early period of metal music uh, from the 70s up through about the 90s. So I'm going to let our guests introduce themselves. Matthias? Yeah, I'm, I'm Dr. Matthias Nordvik. Um, I am an expert on Scandinavian um, mythology and um, pre-Christian uh, Scandinavian religion at the University of Colorado and uh, in Boulder. And I also work with uh, the intersections between uh, heavy metal and um, uh, the Viking Age and, and how um, uh, various kinds of heavy metal uh, makes use of Nordic mythology and, and such things. Heather? Uh, well, my, yeah, my name is Heather. Um, I go by H.A. Larson um, a lot. I, I'm an author. I, I write uh, um, kind of short books about paranormal fiction and some horror stuff. I also write for a local metal magazine called Slime and Grime, um, and I've been a lifelong metalhead, so that's, that's me. And like I said, I'm Trish Lynch. Uh, I was in a lot of metal bands as a kid. Um, and my musical awakening was with uh, metal bands such as Iron Maiden and Judas Priest. Um, I also am a huge Rush fan, and their early period could be classified somewhat as metal. Um, and uh, I, you know, I guess we'll take it from there. So, um, you know, I, I wanted to sort of, and like I said, Rush, you know, uh, being the obvious one. Um, mm -hmm. sort of in the, the, the 70s uh, with, with a very libertarian message and a message based in Ayn Rand. Uh, Neil Peart, who is their lyricist, was uh, at the time uh, identified as an objectivist. Um, and they did 2112, and uh, there was a couple other songs such as Anthem uh, and Something for Nothing, uh, which was also off the 2112 album, that all had this hugely libertarian message to them. Um, and I think a lot of music sort of grew out of that, especially when you, you start, start to talk about the later sort of prog metal, um, sort of examined that period of Rush's music and took it kind of to, to the next step. Um, but, you know, there were, there were plenty of other bands during that period that had messages like that. I mean, there's the, when we, when we, for instance, go uh, to bands like Judas Priest and, and Iron Maiden. Um, I mean, I, I feel like we, we, we see that in, in, in so many uh, aspects of the lyrics. We have uh, Running Free with Iron Maiden, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, there, there's, I, in the early period, I, I feel like there is a sort of a consistent playing around with these ideas, uh, libertarian messages, some, some more refined than others. Some, some more ideological than others. Some, some, some are more sort of uh, um, expressed in, in, in more of a personalized emotional context. And, and some, some have sort of like the messages that, uh, um, that have, uh, where a lot of thought has gone into it, as you mentioned uh, with, uh, with Rush, for instance. Yeah, I mean, Judas Priest as well. I mean, breaking the law. How could you? Yep. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> very much so that the British wave of, of heavy metal. And, it, you know, it's also, if we look at it in a, in a, in a social context of, of, uh, of the UK um, back in the 70s, of course, there's a lot uh, that has uh, gone before. Um, we have the whole hippie movement and, and we have, um, then we have the, the, the reaction to the hippie movement, which is, which is the skinhead movement, which uh, uh, just disclaimer, uh, was not necessarily a racist movement in the no, beginning. No, it wasn't. The punk, um, the punk rockers. The punk yeah, scene. the punk rockers. And, and, uh, and uh, what we see is sort of the rise in the 70s. In, in, in the UK, we see a rise of, a, of, of uh, with, with skinheads, a, a rise of nationalism and, and the interest in, in, in linking, uh, linking to established society probably as a reaction against um, uh, the hippie movement, and on the other hand, then we have the punk rockers, right? So, uh, who who go all out on 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 ideas of of personal freedom and and anarchy in different ways, and in that in that whole mesh, we find the early heavy metal bands in 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 Britain, and and they seem to latch on to to sort of a different 
um, aspects that uh, that that make sense in in the heavy metal scene. We have you know, a lot of historical interest uh, already from the beginning. Um, we have the interest in, in in violence in different ways, which is expressed, you know, through the use of uh, of historical themes often, and 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 also, of course, ideas of apocalypse and holocaust and uh, you know the, the the world going down in flames. And I thought I think what's interesting about that is this: we were talking about Iron Maiden, uh, the Trooper, which mm-hmm. a lot of people, you know, it, it, it's almost a seminal Iron Maiden song. Um, but the message actually is not pro-war when you really look at it. Like exactly. <laughs> it's, it's very anti-war. It's anti-war. very like, this is violence. It's bloody. It's disgusting. It's horrific. It's, you know, and, and they sort of, it's not glorified, uh, you know, and, and it's, I think, I think that that is very interesting about th- some of these bands that talk about the, the violence and, and violence is definitely expressed. Um, and it's somewhat graphic at times. It is not always glorified. It's no, not. Actually, uh, I would say it's it, in many cases. It's the, it's the opposite. It's a, it's it's portraying sort of the uh, the, the negative uh, aspects of that. Uh, it's it's giving you a sense of of um, uh, of that dire situation with with Iron Maiden. If we go to uh, um, two minutes to midnight, right? Um, mm-hmm. We. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's, that's, that's all about that situation of sitting in that Spitfire. Uh, <laughs> in, yeah, and it's know. also, if you, you know, Two Minutes to Midnight is also a reference to um, the, uh, what do they call it, the Doomsday Clock? Yes. Um, which is essentially, you know, uh, how close we are to, to nuclear war. Yes, um, exactly. And that's, yeah. that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to highlight in this because that's what we're seeing in the 70s, right? We're seeing the nuclear scare. We're, we're, we're seeing this, uh, uh, people, a lot of people have this feeling of impending doom, especially in, in Europe, um, yeah, because there's Ace a lot of back and forth. Sorry, what? Ace is, high, Ace is High by Iron Maiden. You know, yeah, yeah, that was, sorry, that was the one that I meant when I said Two Minutes to Midnight. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but Two Minutes to Midnight is, is, is also a really good example of this. Yes. Um, because it was to, is specifically about the doomsday clock. It was yes. about, you know, how close we are to annihilation and, you know, it's sort of dr- trying to drive it home. Yes. And, and I mean, I, I think, um, I think that plays into the, 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 the early aspects of, of heavy metal culture. And I think from that, that's where we see this, um, this, this the response is self-reliance. Uh, the response is that uh, I, we can't rely on these governments. We can't rely on these social institutions that have been established. What I can really rely on is myself. Yep. And you see that a lot in the punk movement too. It's a whole expression yes. of individuality, you know, and that's, you know, that, that's very much objectivist as well. Oh yeah. And I mean, it's interesting because punk, punk really went like several different ways. Um, I mean, what was very interesting in the punk community is, is you did have your sort of anarcho-communists um, who were That's not... That's still true to this day. And it's still yeah. true to this day, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then you also had, you had some of the... And like Matthias said, there's, there's that... Um, you know, some of them had a sense of nationalism. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, especially bands like M.O.D. that were like really pro-U.S. and like, you know... Um, and then you had bands that sort of went uh, a little different in, you know, they, they could have been considered more right libertarian, like Ag Front, uh, Agnostic Front. Um, and I, I, I found when I was a kid, I was very drawn to those ideologies in, um, you know, in, in those, those communities in New York City, uh, in the, the New York hardcore community and things like that. And what's really funny is this, there was a lot... I mean, Agfront really sort of threw the the New York hardcore community into sort of turmoil. Like, do these guys belong here? Like, you know, there was a lot of that kind of stuff going on. And yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's really interesting because uh, I'd, I'd say with MOD, uh, you know, uh, um, latching on to to the to the U.S. Um, might not even at least not from my perspective, translate to a, a kind of nationalism because the U.S. in that context represents freedom, right? 
Um, well, you know, had- Agnostic Front, the Agnostic Front had that, that song that really was what, you know, got them called out by the rest of the scene, and that was Public Assistance. Yep, mm-hmm. Public Assistance, yeah. Which is actually written by Peter Steele. He used to be in Carnivore, and then, of course, you know. Yep, I was going to say, Carnivore also was one of those bands mm-hmm. at the time, and, and then, of course, uh, you know, Carnivore sort of morphed into, I mean, Peter Steele, I mean, you know, essentially morphed mm-hmm. into Typo Negative um, yes. later on. But, like, Carnivore was really, I mean, I remember listening to, you know, and, and, and sometimes they just mocked the establishment in ways that, that were um, almost meant to be sort of trolling or, I mean, the song Jesus Hitler, for instance, um, yes. you know, off of, of Retaliation was, was just, you know, it, it was kind of a shock to the system. But at the time as a kid, I was like, this is great. I was like, I was like this is a really anti-establishment and I'm really into this. You know. that's also, I mean, that's also what they do with type of negative, or Peter Steele does with type of negative, right? I mean, he, he, he mocks, uh, um, well, the goth scene <laughs> himself. Yeah. You know, you oh, know. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's the constant uh, aspect, I think, of, of his art. Um, you know, it's, it's irony all the way through. <laughs> it's irony all the way through, but what's really funny is, is that it, it actually related because – of course, later on in high school, I sort of got into that dark wave goth sort of period of my life. Mm-hmm. And like typo negative later on, like I really appreciated the irony there. Like typo negative didn't come kind of until the late 90s. And like, you know, I was already out of that phase for the most part. And like I when I heard it, I really appreciated it. Like it was it was like, you know, it sort of brought back that because I think that there were a lot of people in the goth scene that were there for the irony to begin with, you know. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. so. laughs> scene kids, you know, you get scene kids everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Most, I think. Um, yeah, uh, but um, but even so, so if we uh, we've moved a little through the uh, the '80s with some of the stuff we talked about, and I just wanted to uh, rewind to the to the early '90s. Um, what we see there with uh, the black metal scene, uh, I feel, is also a lot of uh, rejection of establishment in different ways, right? We even have... the metal community itself. Yes, even the metal the rejection community. Of death metal. It was a rejection of death metal. I mean, they still loved it, but it was like, okay, there's something else, you know, and then... Yes, and, and they, they, they even start rejecting each other too, right? I mean, mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because once, I mean, and look, I still have this tendency. It's like once something is cool, like I'm no longer interested. <laughs> um, and, and it's funny because like that was, so that was kind of the thing, you know, I mean, we sort of missed sort of the, the whole, um, you know, the, the Anthrax, the Metallica, you know, uh, Injustice for All. Um, you know, and of course that's when Metallica started really getting, um, popular, uh, if you will, like before that I was like, really, I mean, I, I came in on, I was really young too. Uh, it was sort of around the time I got into Maiden and Priest, but, uh, you know, there was, uh, um, Ride the Lightning and then Master of Puppets, um, and then came, um, you know, Injustice for All, which had a, a very libertarian message throughout the whole entire album. Um, you know, the sort of anti-war with one. Um, there was uh, the song Injustice for All talking about yes. how the, the, the justice system, the, the justice system in the U.S. was just screwed up and wrong. And this is, you know, how this is every way in which the justice system in the U S is screwed up and wrong. And what's really funny is, is it's just as poignant today as it was then. Um, and it's a song I go back to quite often because my personal activism in libertarianism tends to be criminal justice oriented. So I, it, it there's every once in a while where it's just like, I just have to listen to it and be like, yeah, things are still fucked up. Yeah, and uh, yeah, that's 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 a very good point. Um, I think what we see there in, in so what we see through the eighties is this development where we have these reactions on, uh, to to sort of like a state of the world that uh, um, that a lot of 
you know, different musical genres are reacting to in the, in the late 70s and early 80s. And then, then throughout the 80s, it, it looks like it's consolidating and uh, with bands like Metallica and Justice for, uh, their, their album Justice for All, um, it's, it's sort of a consolidated message. And um, I mean, I, I don't know if I, I, I'm painting with two broad strokes, uh, but, but to me, it kind of seems like that that is what this metal scene is really about in the late 80s and early 90s. This uh, generally uh, promoting various aspects of libertarian messages. I don't know if you uh, guys have a, any comments to that. Oh, definitely. So I wanna, I mean, I wanna... Very anti-authoritarian, you know, that's mm -hmm. a lot of that. And I think, you know, that was probably the period in time when, when musicians in the metal scene really started to see, you know, the, the cracks in the, in the government and the things that, that was going on around them. So, you know. Yeah. We're just talking about the consolidation of messaging in libertarianism or of libertarian messaging in um, heavy metal music during the late eighties and early nineties and specifically Metallica's and justice for all. Um, you know, there you were thrash. I think you see that a lot in thrash metal for sure in general in that time period. Yeah. Yeah. So my recollection of that time period is very interesting because I think also thrash had a, a very, uh, sort of uh, symbiotic relationship with the skateboarding community at the time, uh, mm -hmm. which had, or at least in the U.S., um, and uh, that particular community also had a very libertarian bent because everybody did not want skateboarders all over the place. Um, and, like, it was almost like a public nuisance. And, and, like, skateboarders are like, we're not hurting anybody. Like, we're just r riding around on skateboards and doing tricks. Like, let us do this. Like, you know. And I think that there was a lot of that that sort of crossed over, um, you know, between those two communities. It wasn't just, quote, unquote, metalheads anymore either. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and the music of the skateboarding community during that time was uh, thrash. And, you know, there were a lot of thrash bands. Uh, and, and even Metallica... Um, had, you know, uh, some of the artwork from Metallica was, uh, you know, the, the uh, visual artwork that went along with it uh, was um, done by artists that came out of the skateboarding community and things like that. I, I, I think that that's sort of an interesting sort of uh, side thing there um, where there was, you know, people who were sort of outside the norm but weren't hurting anybody and they started to get this idea and it, it was of course very libertarian but maybe they didn't put their fingers on the word libertarian at the time um which was as long as i'm not hurting anybody please let let me be you know let me be me um and i think that there was a lot of that that went along with uh metal music and especially thrash uh, during that, that late 80s and, and early 90s, um, where you had bands like Anthrax and, and uh, oh God, what was the other one? Jason Newstead was in that band. Um, Voivod? Uh, no, not Voivod, but Voivod is another one, actually. Um, oh God, he was in, um, I, I, it'll come to me, but uh, there, was, there was a lot of different uh, bands that sort of uh, started to sort of get that uh, message of we are, you know, yeah, we may not be the same as you, but just leave us be. Like, well, uh, and a lot, of, a lot of popular music in in every decade seems to it, it seems to speak to people, especially the working class um, kind of people who, um, you know, live a harder existence in some ways. And and thrash metal did that a lot. I think it it appealed to people just kind of like, um, you know, like seventies music, like Black Sabbath and and stuff did, you know, for the UK and, and what punk ended up Black with. Sabbath and Deep Purple and you know mm -hmm. yeah they all spoke to those working class poor you know and, and so did punk and and you see that a lot in the thrash community in the 80s I think and 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 it and what you said earlier kind of ties into a lot of things that people say about libertarianism you know like a lot of people are libertarian they just don't realize it and I think that was probably the same thing I mean they had these ideals and they they saw what was going on around them and they understood that it was a bunch of crap but, you know, they didn't really have a way to, to define it or didn't understand, you know, because a lot of people don't. They, they just they still see the, the world in terms of Democrat and, and Republican. If, if we just uh, um, um, 
if if I may go off track here, uh, Heather, do you think it's the same for for contemporary pop music? Because um, personally, what what I feel like I've been seeing lately is a lot of uh, sort of more uh, establishment messaging than, than 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 anything else in 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 the broad popular music scene but what do you think of that well i mean i don't listen to pop music admittedly but um just the imaging that i see from it is enough to make me think that yeah it's very status quo you know mm -hmm. it's very much follow the leader you know it's a lot of marketing and, and things like that too so yeah i definitely agree with that i mean i think there are some i think there are some exceptions um and and sometimes those exceptions are the standouts uh with mm -hmm. pop music for example pink right like she's not exactly your your run of the mill pop music. There is an anti establishment message somewhat in there. There's the I, I got drunk, went out, like this this sort of like I'm I'm not your good girl image that is very in earnest rather than like manufactured. Um <laughs> If we look at it in terms of like you know self dependence and um, and and taking and, and self empowerment taking pay, uh, power over your own life so to speak, um, I'd say a, a an artist like Beyonce also seems to be, be yes. putting out a lot of those types of messages, right? But it, that those are I think those are the exceptions. But what's yeah. interesting is is the exceptions stand out so much mm -hmm. that they actually have gotten followings outside of people who listen to pop music mm. um you know so they do cross over and it's like if you talk to people that don't really listen to pop and you're like oh what do you think of pink sometimes they'll go wow i really like her like mm. you know that kind of thing um but it's i i think that when it comes to pop music pop music is almost by by necessity sort of manufactured and always has been um, you know, whatever the pop genre of the time. Um, and then you had obviously had your standouts like, you know, uh, you know, going back to the 60s, even, you know, the Beatles sort of tipped off the Beatles were your standout, but they sort of created uh, sort of these these sort of manufactured bands after that that were trying to recreate that feeling, right? And then yeah. you had the Monkees, right? And and it was like, you know, the Monkees is it's it was manufactured music, like it was specifically manufactured, um, you know, and and not that it was horrible music, it just it, it wasn't. It, I never. It, the Beatles were sort of in earnest and, and there was sort of honesty about the Beatles that, that you didn't get from those manufactured bands that came after the Beatles. And mm -hmm. I think that pop music these days, which uh, pop music is kind of across, like there's cross, uh, crosses of hip hop and pop music these days. And there's crosses of, um, you know, dance music and things like that. But it's clearly meant to, emulate some of the anti-establishment music that came before it yeah. uh you know like the trance and the the um you know and some of the the earlier um you know sort of uh what i would say club scene um you know the uh, like club kids type yeah. stuff but is uh, that what we yeah. see all the time with uh, with the pop uh, genre or whatever we we want to call it the, the pop music in, at large, right? Because we also have that with, with the heavy metal scene. We have a band like uh, Five Finger Death Punch. They, uh, they seem very much to be formula-based, if mm -hmm. you ask me. Uh, I don't know much about them. I've heard a couple of their songs. They, they seem to be more uh, so, sort of using an anti-establishment uh, anti messaging uh, uh, to, to actually promote establishment <laughs> i know i was thinking that too i'm like oh, yeah. as much as as much as i actually kind of like ffdp like i agree there like they're very formulaic very like you oh, know yeah, but that's that's the thing right i mean i, I like a lot of their music too because you know it, it, it's the spot it's that formula yeah. that, that i'm into right <laughs> yeah totally um you know and and it's and it's funny because you know again you get these sort of mixing of genres as you sort of go through, you know, mixing of, uh, like I said, you have prog metal um, and, and, you know, in sort of the, the late eighties, early nineties, you had bands like Queensryche, 
right? Mm -hmm. And Queensryche had a very like, you know, don't trust the government message uh, in Operation Mindcrime. Um, that was just, it was, it was overly blatant. I mean, it was a spy story, right? Like, but like, it was a spy story from the point of view of an anarchist. Um, and it, it was just, you know, and not that he was, they were even portraying the protagonist as a good guy even, but it was more like that the protagonist was fighting the government and doing some really fucked up things while he was doing it. Um, but still that the government needed to be fought. Um, and you know, those, like I said, a lot of those bands sort of grew out of that early period when you see bands like Rush having concept albums that were very, uh, you know, uh, you know, those concept album ideas went into metal. I mean, we were talking, uh, off the, uh, screen about King Diamond, um, and King Diamond was really, uh, you know, concept album oriented uh, and avowed Satanist um, and, you know, extremely, and the music was extremely technical, but, you know, you sort of had these, I think metal was a place where a lot of people could experiment mm -hmm. um, with those, with, with different things and who they were and, and, you know, and without really fear of, rejection by the community itself because the community was already outcast. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. grindcore for you. I mean, that's how grindcore came about pretty much, you know, you've got this extreme form of, of metal and it was also very anti-establishment um, short, fast songs. I mean, yeah. you know, Napalm, Nap Napalm death as the shortest song in history, one second long and it just says you suffer, but why? <laughs> wow. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, you, you see this still in the heavy metal community, right? Um, it, this it, a lot of a lot of people uh, feel, uh, it, you know, a strong sense of um, a community and camaraderie uh, at um, heavy metal festivals and mm -hmm. and so on. And and it's often predicated on this notion of being outsiders in 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 a society where where you look different in different ways or act different or listen to different music. And, and so on. Um, Most accepting community in the world. I, I've always felt so at home in the metal community and accepted. And, and you won't find a better community out there. I mean, sure, you've got your jerks, but you, know, you won't find a better community than the metal community. No, I, I, I agree. And, and, and it's, actually, it's actually quite interesting because even people who break protocol and don't wear black are, are also <laughs> welcome there. <laughs> so I think that's a good place that we can um, sort of tie this up. Um, I, I'm Trish Lynch for Politipeeps. Uh, like, subscribe, ring that bell uh, to get notifications of our content. And Matthias, where can we find you online? You can find me on my webpage, which is uh, nordicmythologychannel.com. Uh, and also by searching my name, uh, Matthias Nordvig, uh, on uh, YouTube and uh, Google and also, uh, search for the Nordic Mythology Channel wherever you uh, uh, wish. It's uh, on Facebook, too. And, uh, and I am also available on Instagram. Heather? Yep, you can go to my website, which is halarsonauthor.com. Um, I'm also on Facebook as halarsonauthor and Instagram as well. Thank you. And for Politipeeps, this is Trish Lynch, and we'll see you soon.